But again, it's how do you find the right people in the right culture? So that lends to the answer of your question is you have to decide and why I created this company is I can't work for everybody and everybody can't work for me. And that statement has to apply to both the employees that I have working for me, owners, designers, and subcontractors. All those, which makes it very difficult. Welcome to the Attraction Pros Podcast, where we discuss the latest trends and challenges facing the attractions industry today. We chat with some of the top leaders in the field and provide resources that will help develop your career in this great industry. I am Josh Liebman. I am obsessed with the guest experience and helping attractions make that their top priority for success. And I'm Matt Heller. I am passionate about organizational effectiveness, leadership development, and employee engagement. Now sit upright, hold on tight, and get ready for the Attraction Pros Podcast. This episode of the podcast is kindly sponsored by Attractions IO, the guest experience platform behind Merlin Entertainment's San Diego Zoos and the Kennedy Space Center's branded mobile apps. And like us, the folks at Attractions IO are on a mission to elevate our experiences. Their latest launch adds in app photos to the Attractions IO mobile app, giving guests more time to view, purchase, and share their media with loved ones. Impressively, 88% of consumers say that they trust content and recommendations from their friends and family over any other form of marketing, making user-generated content like photo sharing an essential strategy for your marketing team this season. To learn more about Attractions.io and the new in-app photo feature, visit attractions.io slash photos. Hey, Matt, how's it going? It's going fantastically, Josh. How are you? I'm doing great. Question for you. Yes. Matt, have you ever built a theme park? You mean like outside of Roller Coaster Tycoon? Yes. <laughs> then the answer would be no. <laughs> I have not. Have you? Outside of Roller Coaster Tycoon? <laughs> right. Outside of the uh, Lincoln Logs and Lego and Connect sets in my basement as a child? There you go. Yeah. Uh, also outside of that, no, as well. <laughs> but the reason I ask has to do with our guest today, Jerry Davis. He is the president and principal of Peak CM, which is a construction management company. Whether CM stands for construction management or not is uh, yet to be determined, but they focus on constructing large projects. And one of their biggest areas that they work on is theme parks and attractions. And what's really great to hear is his stories of project management and how things kind of come to life, but not from a, this is what everybody else sees standpoint, right? A lot of behind the scenes uh, type of things. He talks about controlled chaos. He talks about um, construction, uh, constructing attractions um, and really giving people an understanding of what that process is before they even walk in the gates. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and what's really cool is, you and I, along with you know a lot of our audience, come from the operator side. We we show up at parks that are built, right? And whether we're guests or you know working in them and, and kind of working with the existing infrastructure of the park, this allows us really to I would say kind of see how that comes to life and the decisions that need to be made before breaking ground, even in the pre-construction phase, even in uh, during the construction phase, and then really sort of aligning your thought process on everything that you see that is built and really looking at all that goes into making that decision. Yeah. One of the things that was kind of going through my mind uh, with this conversation was so many times, even as enthusiasts, we might say, well, why didn't they X, Y, Z, right? Why didn't they make that a little bit longer? Why didn't they make this a little faster? Why didn't they blah, 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 right? And you really get a sense of what goes into all those decisions. And maybe that's what they wanted to do, like from a design standpoint, but then you have to balance the quality and the cost. Mm -hmm. And Jerry goes into a lot of detail on what that process is all about. And so you may want something that goes a hundred miles an hour, right? But in order to get it done relatively on time and something that's going to be really high quality, 
Maybe you get it to 80 miles an hour, right? And so you're balancing all those different things um, in order to make the best possible project, um, even though it might not be what was in rig- originally envisioned. Right. It's uh, the balancing the the quality, time, and cost. Jerry says you can have two out of the three. So uh, it's just so fascinating to hear uh, just his outlook on it. Uh, clearly, so passionate about what he does, and you know he shares a lot of insights from a lot of projects that he's worked on over the last many years, uh, decades even. And uh, just can't wait to to get to this interview with him. Well, let's get to it. Hey, Jerry, welcome to the Attraction Pros podcast. How are you doing today? Good. You? I'm doing great. Thanks for asking. Um, so you're a little different than some of the other guests we've had, um, you know, coming from the construction side. So can you tell people just a little bit about you and your company, Peak CM, and maybe some some of your experience in the industry? Sure. Peak CM is a commercial general contractor. Uh, we actually specialize in a lot more than just the attraction stuff in hospitality. Uh, we have markets in the healthcare, industrial manufacturing, uh, the public sector, not so much uh, in terms of education anymore. But basically, we pretty much touch every sector except for uh, transportation or airplane, airport type work. Uh, we have done terminal or hangars and stuff, but not terminals. In terms of me, I'm a Commercial general contractor licensed in the state of Florida with a uh, civil structural uh, engineering background from the University of Central Florida. Cool. So first of all, go Knights. I'm also a a UCF Knight. Oh, Uh, cool. Can you tell us a little bit about, before we started recording, you were sharing a little uh, a little of the experience that you've done in the attraction in the theme park space. Would love to know as far as uh, some of the the projects that you've worked on and been a part of. Yeah, so the beginning, which was... um, with a previous company out of school, uh, which was Beers Construction, which is a great company that was based out of Atlanta uh, that eventually sold to and kind of was absorbed by Skanska. Um, So that was kind of my first start into, you know, the attraction construction world. And that was Superhero Island. So when Universal was doing construction of Islands of Adventure, uh, Beers uh, was one of the main general contractors that was responsible for one of the islands. And basically the way they broke it up was there was a general contractor for each of the islands that was out there and beers had control of superhero Island. And so can you, can you tell us a little bit about that process? Because there's a lot of people um, that obviously have been there as guests and probably don't understand all the things that went into creating such an experience. It was wild. Um, You know, and universal is doing the epic now, uh, which we're not doing anything with, but, you know, you stay in this industry for long enough, all my friends, in fact, you know, we were just at an event last Thursday, you know, and kind of talking about it, but, you know, those are, they're kind of wild um, in terms of how that whole process goes and it can get a little chaotic. And as anybody who's been involved in it um, knows, and they've done it multiple times and I've done multiple things afterwards too. So other projects, um, that I've done for both Universal and some even for Disney. And those projects, they're kind of like controlled chaos. And usually they get behind schedule. Um, and it's tough. You can't really blame someone for, for you know, or point the finger at why it is because the art directors or the creative people, they have a specific vision and there's not everything you can get in terms of design and constructability get on paper. And so those things will change or modify as you're going through the process. And those affect both time, quality, cost, and then you're trying to deal with those. And um, the best way to do it is just to try to create multiple lines of communication um, with the different departments and then try to have the best workflow that can handle it. And I mean, kind of islands was built not really during the the digital age. You know, that was pre a lot of this stuff. Uh, remember, it was cool. I mean, we had email, you know, and we had a construction management software system, but that wasn't cloud-based or any of those things. You know, scheduling wasn't cloud-based. It was all server kind of based systems. And 
the even terms of how digital information was sent. Again, you kind of had email, but didn't have email with large files or any of these sorts of things. And the, you know, we had Nextel radios. Like that's how stuff was communicated. You didn't do text messages. You could, but text messages, it took a while, right? I mean, that was the whole old keyboards and stuff. So that was built really by old school document control type systems versus now where so much stuff that we do is digital and touch screens and interactive. And we do a lot of that stuff. You know, we're getting involved in LIDAR, for example, and the rest of those. Um, so stuff's changed. And even through those different projects, um, and they, they can get very complex. Jerry, I'm wondering about the uh, the conversations that happen at the beginning of a project, even before you know a, a, a shovel hits the dirt. Is you know you, you talked about the uh, like the art director has you know has the vision and then bringing that to life. But curious as far as kind of all of the stakeholders who might need to have input, want to have input, or that you would want for them to have input in order for the project to be successful. Uh, for me personally, I've been a part of the opening of, of a few theme parks. And there was a time I came in, you know, was, while the park was under construction, I was a manager and they handed me a blueprint and said, all right, Josh, where do you need power? And I'm thinking, well, I don't think I'm really going to know that until I'm standing in the building itself. So curious as far as kind of working with those individuals who need to have input, but also making sure that everyone's coming at it with with proficiency and I don't know balance and mindfulness of all the, the pieces coming together. Yeah, it's a challenge. So, and it's kind of developed or changed. So when I came into Superhero, that was kind of, they had already kind of gone through the pre-construction phase. So I can't talk much about how that one was done. Um, but they then went and did a bunch of other projects, um, some for Disney, quite a few for Universal. And I always, and <laughs> they don't do it a lot. And we haven't done much for Universal post kind of 2020 type stuff. Um, but before it was always, we were always trying to push the connections and the stuff we have is stop hard bidding stuff. Stop having GCs come out and price everything and give you a hard bid and try to negotiate with some people where you're kind of setting, what's your general, con what do you think your general conditions are going to take to build this, which is your staffing, right? And you know, the basics, what's your fee and some of these other items, but then bring it on, start with pre-construction and get the estimating department and start trying to fill in those gaps and ask the questions like you are, where someone from the construction side is kind of pushing and pulling that information from you on power locations. And you might not know what certain things require certain power. And then power, do you talk in low voltage or are you talk in high voltage? You know, are you talking, you know, a dedicated circuits versus not? And it can get very complex in terms of how those whole systems go together. And then some things you just don't realize, you know? So when you're talking about, okay, I'm walking down this corridor and all of a sudden I want people to feel really cold or really hot. Well, you're not thinking power for that, but obviously there's some sort of piece of equipment there that's going to be needed. That's going to have to achieve that goal of what you're looking to do. Right. And how that, how that's achieved. So part of that is, it's a collaborative approach to really have that conversation. And the more you can build that collaborative thing from the start, the better off you're going to be. So a lot of the ones that we did originally, we were just kind of bidding, you know, giving the numbers and we were close or in there or low. And then we'd come into these design meetings. And then that's when we had start asking the questions and you'd get creative people and the designers and maybe then there's an owner's rep or, you know, or the, the construction rep people from the park itself. Right. And then we're the, the general contractor. And sometimes we'd have our subcontractors with us and stuff too. And not to knock the designers, but sometimes the designers, they don't care about budget or they, they, and they just want something that's looking good. So when the creative guy goes, geez, I really want a skylight here. And I use this same association, not just with attractions, but we do a lot of, did a lot of stuff with resorts, ski resorts, tangent for a second, I built a hundred million dollar hotel with an indoor water park where the roof opens up, you know, at a ski resort. So 
you you got to kind of ask questions sometimes in the designers because the designer will just start drawing it. And we are we're in there going and we're always kind of the the a hole in the room is we're like, wait, either that's not going to work because there's a structural member right there. Yeah. Right. Or the sun's coming in is going to affect it. We've done this. I, I call attractions like ice arenas and the rest of those things, too. Um, or cost. I'm going, wait a minute, guys. You just got on us that you're over budget or you're right at your budget. And now you're saying, boy, it'd be great to add a huge skylight right here. <laughs> so are we going to take something away or are we increasing the budget? What are we doing? Because you can't just add something without taking something away unless you're increasing the budget. So that's the challenge that we face. I mean, we're really not anybody's friend when we're going into those meetings. Um, it's something as a culture, uh, as with this company and it's part, when you start your own company and the size we are, we've, we kind of average around 20 million a year, uh, but we've gone up to almost 50 million a year. And in terms of projects we've done, but when you come to the smaller ones, you know, you're doing sometimes smaller projects or whatever, but our goal as a company is to just be straightforward. And so we try to have that black and white conversations as much as possible. And sometimes that can come across as aggressive or abrasive, but I would much rather have that than yes, somebody, and then have either a budget or a quality control issue down the road. And that's what we try to do is bring the experience from anything that we've done. And sometimes even doing something on a school lends itself to a restaurant that we've done or something on a restaurant has helped us out on a school job. So it really just depends. And we're just trying to bring our experience of both us and our subcontractors into that meeting and have real, sometimes very difficult conversations. Well, I would imagine some of those conversations um, really are trying to navigate those three things you've talked about, right? The time that it takes, the quality that you want and how much it's going to cost, right? So Obviously, that's a balancing act, but which one, if there is one, tends to win out over the other ones? Well, you've seen it, and I'm gonna I'm gonna butcher it, but you, we've all seen that um, little cliche analogy thing they do, right? You can have two of the three, you can't have all three, right. and of the what you just said, and you see it a lot. It gets posted on LinkedIn, <laughs> or you see it in any different things, right? Um, it depends. And there's really no answer to that. And I still try to achieve that. Um, the one that usually, when you really want quality, um, let me think about this for a second so that I say this the right way. When you really want quality, your time gets sacrificed. That's just a fact, right? Look at the old days and look how stuff was constructed and look at intricate finished carpentry. One of my general superintendents is literally a master finished carpenter and they just don't do it like that anymore. And even sometimes the stuff they do, it's coming from robotics or, you know, pre-made type stuff. You know, they're not doing it kind of the old finished carpentry way. And so I would say the the quality if you really want that upper upper end quality or you're trying to design as you go which which is really kind of quality right because if you're changing the design you're doing stuff not necessarily saying something's wrong you're just adjusting as you're going that approach has a hard time with time um it's why i don't like some of these fast track ones where they're like yeah we're gonna do a design build and start construction and do it in phases it's always a mess because you can't line up when you have all these different components. You can't line up your time and your schedule to go without impeding or slowing down subcontractors or whatever else is going on and still permitting authorities, right? Because you still got to get stuff permitted and you still got to get stuff approved and you still got to get stuff inspected. So if you're kind of designing on the fly, but then you've got to get it approved, how does that really work? And can you really build it without it's going? I don't like that. And the way I've seen it is, you take risks where people are building stuff where it's not fully permitted yet or not fully inspected. I'm not a fan of that approach. So it's there's, there's no perfect answer to this, but I don't think quality and time go together. Um, full, like you can have a good quality project in a decent time frame, 
but you got to know how those go. Now cost. Cost is relative. And especially now in this industry or in, in this time period we're in, cost is crazy. Like, I, I don't even know any other way. It's why we didn't do a huge growth movement um, post-2020 because I didn't want to have these crazy conversations with new clients on why their stuff is 40 or 50% more, not 10 or 15%, 40 or 50% more. Why is it 40 or 50%? Because your material and everything has escalated 15 to 25%, but the lead times have now gone crazy. And what affects, what impact does the lead time, does a time frame have? That's your cost because the general conditions, the staff that I have, well, I can't take staff off a job. Where am I going to put them? And then put them back. So when we have delays or when you have lead times and when a project grows because things take longer to get, your project goes from being a nine-month project to a 12 or 13-month project. So now you've added you know, three or four months of general conditions on that project, which general conditions, depending on what you're doing, can run anywhere from 5% to 10% of a project, depending on the complexity. Add that, now you're almost doubling it if you're talking on a nine-month project, right? Add, so those costs just go, and some owners don't get it, and they don't want to pay it. And so it's a tough conversation to have when those go. So cost has been nuts. Um, but before what we're into, you could deal with budgets and the big issue with cost that helps with time to kind of wrap your, your question up is if you're thinking ahead, and this is what we try to tell clients. And sometimes it's just getting in first and getting in front of them or getting that relationship started. If a client is thinking and slow and in, in, in doing the right steps and not saying, geez, I've already got my design. Now I'm bringing my GC on and I want to go into permitting and start construction in three months, especially right now. But this was true even before 2020. You're going to pay a premium, period. Whereas if you bring a construction manager at risk versus just a paper construction manager, but a construction manager at risk and you're doing pre-construction and they're setting, they're doing estimates, they're gauging where we're at in the market they're letting subcontractors and suppliers know that something's coming through. We're understanding any lead time issues because we still had those before 2020. Not as many. We're gauging all that stuff. We're getting an idea of the market. We're letting people know. So subs aren't freaking out. They're not just rushing to throw a number at it. They can forecast what their chances of getting it and seeing that project come. So they're going to give you a better number. You're going to get a better number. And we can line those up and we can adjust it and say, well, hey, you know what? This other project's coming out the bid here. So let's go in front of it or let's go right behind it. So when you have time, you can work the number and get the best possible thing you have. And typically any design or a lot of the designs, I mean, they're anywhere from four months to 12 months anyway. So if you're bringing that construction manager at risk, that general contractor involved at the beginning and at the pre-construction phase and having conversations with them, you're going to get the best number you can. And this goes for restaurants and stuff like that too. And like all the game times that we've done, you know, what Mike has learned is um, with game time is bring the GC on as early as possible and have those conversations that he's not thinking of and he's looking at it from the other side. And that's really yeah. saved um, really saved him. But so that's, that's how kind of those fit. I think time's a pivot. Um, cost and quality are easy, right? That's, that's obvious. So you don't, I mean, and also cost and low quality. So those things, those, th that's obvious. I think the time is that middle one that, that kind of pivots. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you mentioned game time. Uh, we had Mike Abacassis on the on the podcast a few months ago, um, and then uh, obviously he uh, connected connected us with you. Uh, when you're working on a, a project like game time, or whether it's you know in the attractions industry, uh, you know you talk about kind of the the multiple different industries that you work in, and you know looking on your website, you can see how it's all you know broken down. Uh, how does a project like building a facility like game time differ from 
I noticed one of your projects was a urine toxicology clinic. <laughs> it, are there a lot of similarities or a lot of differences? I, I would say like, how, how do those connect with each other? <laughs> it, the, it, so, so the quick one, the way they connect the easiest is quality control. And the, the game time is different than, and I'm not trying to knock, Mike and I had this conversation, I'm not trying to knock the Dave and Busters of the world, but Mike has kind of done this Dave and Busters X, but esque kind of thing, but more family oriented at a much higher quality. So the construction quality of a game time is really crazy. It's one of the things that Mike and I have had some knocked out, drag out discussions over and it's good. It's, it's, we have a great relationship so we can go through that, but, and it's kind of the, some of the things that I've, I've talked to him about, but he is very particular. I mean, we've gone down to going crazy of exactly how the finish of tile and how his, the Schluter trim details in tile are and how flush it is and how that Schluter trim detail in the bathrooms fits in the bathrooms. We've spent hundreds of man hours discussing new designs for his sinks in the bathrooms. So Mike's an outlier in terms of these, where some of these restaurants, you just go in. And I mean, you guys have known this. You go into a restaurant and you go into their bathrooms and you're looking at the towel work and you're like, did they mean for this to all have this kind of <laughs> rough look? You know, or was that just real kind of shoddy, right? I mean, so we've got to see that before. It, it, it's obsessive. It's it's really amazing. So the quality control is much, is very similar between the, our healthcare sector and game time. Now, in terms of restaurants in general and FECs, there's a different level between healthcare sector and normal restaurants and whatever we've also done very high-end restaurants so that's i think why our relationship with with game time is so special because we've done very high-end hotels and very high-end bars and restaurants inside those with details that are attraction-esque i mean i've done previous company but then we've gone and done additional stuff that took the same thing. So with the same client, previous company, my company, um, but at ski resorts, taking a, a bar or a restaurant and adapting parts of the culture of where that resort is. So a bar that we're doing that's facing a tram at a ski resort and taking pieces of the old tram cable and and integrating them in the ff and &E. Oh, that's easy, right? That's a piece of cake. Why don't we do that? So that's where the owner comes in, who is very, one of the owner's reps, was very eccentric that worked there. Okay, great. That's his idea. Well, that doesn't work the way you're thinking it works. So first of all, a cable has all grease on it and oil and everything else. So A, you got to cut it. That's somewhat easy, right? Now you got to make sure it doesn't fray because you got a safety issue. Now, how do you coat something that's had years of oil and grease and everything else on it? And how do you incorporate that? And where do you incorporate it into FF&E? And how do you make it not look weird? And that whole process is crazy and tons of trial and error, tons of trial and error until you figure out, okay, we can do this with the cables, but we have to clean it here. And then we're coating it here. Um, it gets... It gets wild, but that's the part of the quality that you start figuring out. So we'll do that. And you figure out how do you match things in a resort is very attraction-esque, just as much as the theme park is. What's that feeling when you're sitting in a restaurant at a resort that if you're blindfolded and put in there, you and then you take off the blindfold, you know where you're at. Like you have a feeling of what that community or what that resort is compared to somewhere else, right? And- there's tons of examples that we've done um, with the different resorts that we've done and how to incorporate those. And to tie that into the one last spot is when we did an indoor water park, the, I remember this great guy. And this is a, this is kind of a cool story is, and this very much leads to the game. It has to do with the same game time thing of a brand, right? Is the sales and marketing guy for, 
the indoor water park that we did at this ski resort was literally a genius. I mean, the guy is, it, it, he had won so many awards for this ski resort for best marketing campaigns of the year. It was like, people were just getting frustrated to even submit at these ski area association conferences. I mean, he was just crushing it. Crazy, unbelievable marketing. But he hated the water park. Hated it. Hated this indoor water park. Saw the, the, the revenue, saw the need, understood it but hated it because of how it affected the brand of the resort. So the question was, how do we get this guy on board hmm. to, to, to be part of this? Right. And so he he was very similar and no Mickey mouse, no ears. I don't want that. I don't want. And so his first part was, I don't want any theming. And that was the comment that comes out of him. And I said, you got to have theming. What do you want to, vanilla box you want you want a ymca no offense for your for your indoor water park no 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 i just want it to be in our brand i said branding's theming and then i i, I sat down with him this was actually me the gc but we had a kind of a special relationship we did tons of work for both previous company and my company now through their stuff but i sat down and i showed him that example of um that bar with the train cables. I said, that's theming. Branding and theming are the same thing. Theming is what story you're telling. Branding is what is the story, right? It's it's the same exact thing. So once he got on board with, and we just didn't use the word theming anymore. So we said branding. So once we did that, he was fully on board and it was amazing. And so this indoor water park had things that tied into the ski resort, you know, and the, 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 the lazy river itself, which was not lazy because the ski area is known for being really aggressive. We had rapids in it and other things, but how do you do that safe? And the walls didn't just look really like a pool wall. They looked like rocks and the rocks look just like the mountain. Not like something out of Arizona, but like something that was up north. And a lot of the the different people or things, and we created a brand, those were based on ski components and areas. So that whole characterization turned into that branding, you know, of, of what it was. But it was a quality control thing, and it was limited and specific at how it was at. So... With anything and you have healthcare, you get the same thing. You get that quality control of how you taking something specific and making sure it's right. But um yeah, Mike is I I I associate Mike to more of the theme park attraction than a restaurant mm -hmm. because he's very specific at certain details from columns to his bar details to again the sink in the bathroom. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Well, Jerry, I, I appreciate you sharing that about Mike because Josh and I know him pretty well and, and know that he's very um, conscious about quality, uh, you know, and and very detail oriented. But I would imagine that and, and you mentioned he was kind of an outlier. I would imagine that there's people that you work with that may not care as much. But then there's probably also people that may even go the other way. And I'm curious if there's been times when you're like, they're asking us to do something that we just won't put our stamp on. You know, or and maybe it's a maybe it's a cost issue, right? And they're saying, "Oh, just put yep. something in there." At the end of the day, are people going to know that it's Peak CM that put that together, or are they going to associate with that brand or you know the the facility? So, how do you sort of navigate those situations? It's hard. I can tell you, it's unbelievably hard, especially when we try to be. We're a very black and white kind of company it's how i try to hire and it's the hardest part about trying to grow post 2020 is finding the right people um we bring issues up whether they're internal or not right away you know and that's kind of hard to try to teach and create the culture for the people in here um to do that and some owners and designers don't like it the ones that we build relationships with understand it um and those grow. So it's, it's, it's one of the challenges we have is trying to grow a company. But I kind of say this to answer your question is 
you know, when I did this and why I created this company is I wanted to build stuff a certain way and to have a certain name. And what you have to decide or what I had to decide, and I did this before with the larger companies is with, because I had my own divisions inside almost each company, even a little one. When years I was doing my own stuff at Universal after everybody left, you know, and then I had kind of my education and was doing my own buildings and had staff that I grew up in there. Definitely at PCL, I was doing stuff at Universal and had that process. When I went up north to the other company, I had my own vision. I mean, that company started out at 25 million a year. We finished when I left at about 180 million a year. And I was doing over 100 million a year that myself. I had a bigger staff when I worked for that company than I do now in my own company. Um, we got up close to that when we were doing about 50 million. Um, but again, it's how do you find the right people in the right culture? So that lends to the answer of your question is you have to decide and why I created this company is I can't work for everybody and everybody can't work for me. And that statement has to apply to both the employees that I have working for me, owners, designers, and subcontractors, all those, which makes it very difficult. Um, but the one thing we can pride ourselves by saying is you always know what you get. We're always straightforward and we're fair. Some people might disagree with that, um, but we're consistently fair on what we term, what we feel the word fair is. And that is truly trying to be as center balanced as you can, which is lobby and argue for the owner against the designer if you need to. Lobby and argue for the owner against the subcontractors if you need to. But in the same token, if you got to go and lobby and argue at the owner for the subcontractor or for the designer, do it. Any of those. We have to try to be the best mediator we can, but also be objective at our own failures or our own mistakes when we have them and then fix them. And that's a lot easier said than done. That's a lot easier said than done is to try to tell somebody, you can admit your mistake. I don't care. Mistakes don't bother me. Repeat mistakes I have an issue with. Ignorance and laziness I have an issue with. And that's, again, internal, external. But if you have a mistake and someone comes to a mistake, that's fine. Come to me with a solution or come to me when you and just tell me the mistakes there. And so this goes you know, to your question of how we apply it outside. To, to other clients and the same thing. So there are times where there's clients we just, I, I, we just won't work with, you know, and um, we had a client that I've done two projects with and their culture is a little different. They're Canadian. Um, and there's some questioning of integrity and honesty that kind of fit into it where they want it just, you know, being fair. Right. And, I just said, look, that's our, this is our last project. We're not going to do any more work. And we did them and the projects are great. Um, and that's not great to do. And that's sometimes people go, oh, you know, but that affects your revenue or go. It doesn't matter. Like there's a certain point where you got to stand up for what the company is and just be confident in it. This is what we do. And we want good quality. We want fairness. And it's got to be, it's not a two-way street because you got other people. It's this three-legged stool. So it's almost like a, <laughs> I say this on the fly, like a roundabout, right? That's got three intersections coming in, you know? Someone can't just stop in the middle of the roundabout and blame the other person. And someone can't just come flying through the round. Like that's got to work. And I might use that analogy going forward. And <laughs> say, but that's kind of the example is what I'm trying to say is, you got to be able to put the quality. Now, when someone comes to us, that doesn't mean that we all have to do four seasons or boutique resort hotel work. We've done, and I'm not knocking it. We've done a Wood Springs hotel. Okay. We try to do that at the best quality we can being competitive, given the expectation and the level where that's at. 
right? And we'll do it. And those are challenging. It's why we don't do a lot of lower end hotels because sometimes the playing field isn't fair. And what I mean by that is what I can't compete with is Billy Joe and his pickup truck, you know, that's cutting corners on permitting and inspections and subcontractors and safety, um, legal stuff, lean laws, the rest of those things. And a lot of those things kind of happen and subs come walking in and don't have the right safety or they aren't tracking who the sub and the sub tier are and who you're working for. And there's a lot of legal stuff in that. That's all great until something happens and then you're toast. And that's why you see then a lot of companies get crushed or go belly up because of that. Well, it's hard enough to do what we do. So we just don't take those gambles. Um, so yeah, it's, it, it makes the matches. So when you have someone like a game time and a mic, um, it works out and you'll, you'll know really quick on that first job or so how it works. I and mean, Mike and I got into some knockdown drag out. I'll call them fights, but they're not like, <laughs> like, like issues at the beginning on the first job, because I'm pushing my way. He's got his stuff, but he will tell you, and if you brought him back on, he will tell you is 90% of the stuff I told him was right. And he learned and he agreed. And it's not that I'm, I'm, I'm right on this, but when it came to certain construction things that I was trying to, to push and tell him <laughs> is, and there's a lot of things that we've learned from Mike too. So don't get me wrong, but on those specific things, he then took those and said, I'm not making that mistake again, or I'm listening to you here. And on the next game time, we did that, you know, so don't try to save a bunch of stuff and try to do a remodel demo full areas out where he was trying to cheapen it up and say, "I right, we can save some of these things where he realized by trying to save those items cost him more, you know, um, him trying to save a buck by buying a bunch of stuff and then him dealing with lead times or coordination issues coming through because the owner's furnishing it, but the plumber didn't supply it. And the plumber's like, now what do you want me to do with this? I didn't have this. You didn't tell me this was owner supplied. Okay. Now you want me to install all this stuff, but everything's not here. So you just gave me, you want me to, we've furnished the sink. And now you want us to install your fixtures, but I've got to go touch this thing three times because you brought me the faucet, but the drain's not here yet. Right. Just give you an example. So these yeah. are things we learn. These are quality control and those do affect time and cost. So it's just trying to have those conversations and then be able to keep track of it and learn those lessons. So one of the things we do is we sit down with clients that we have repeat clients. If it's similar to something they've done before, we'll sit down and go through all the issues that happened on the previous project during the design phase. So when we were doing game time Daytona, we sat down and pulled up, even though they were a little bit apples and oranges in terms of the spaces, but it didn't matter. We wanted to, to note that. So we went through every single RFI request for information, every single cost issue or change that had come up, every single one and said, do these apply to this project? You'd be surprised, even though they're apples and oranges in terms of facilities, um, how many applied that then the designers taking those and incorporating them into his drawings or we're making sure we're getting those scopes assigned to the correct spot with subcontractors during the pre-construction phase. Um, so that's a great example of taking those lessons and then incorporating in the future. Yeah. Jerry, this is all so fascinating and a, a lot of it very, very much eye opening too, because I have to imagine that uh, you're, you're kind of sharing maybe questions that uh, some people aren't asking, but perhaps should as far as if they're going to buy the faucet of knowing how that's going to connect to the drain and what the lead time on that is going to be and really trying to uh, see beyond perhaps what's in the immediate peripheral. Uh, curious, would love to know. What advice would you give to someone who might be wanting to pursue a career in construction management? It's a good question. Um, experience is a huge key. So I would say if you're going to do, if you want to go into construction, the experience is the first part. So if you're going to go get a building construction degree, which is different than a construction engineering or an engineering degree. So most people who go into building construction, go into construction. 
most people who go into engineering go into design, right? Then you get this construction engineering where it's kind of a hybrid that they go either way. Um, not as much design, more, more construction, but then the construction engineering degree isn't as big. So if you're going building construction, you really, there's, there's, there's two things that are key to me and why truthfully, I don't hire a lot of building construction people. One, you need to get some experience. So while you're going and getting a building construction degree, which I'm just going to say as an opinion is absolutely not as hard as a construction engineering or an engineering degree. You need to get construction experience. You need to be an intern. You need to get a part-time job. You need to get involved and try to get some of that real life construction experience. And I'll tell you why. The other is you need to take some classes or learn what engineering and the base core of why we hire engineers are is the analytics in the organization. You need to learn as a building construction how to time manage and how to approach problems and how to really understand stress, pressure, and deadlines. So what we see is, this is when I was doing a bunch of hiring at you know the different companies more than how much we hire now, but we still do it. I'm actually just just hired another civil engineer starting out as an office engineer versus some building construction people is when a building construction guy comes in to work for you, he's got great knowledge. They probably know the scheduling software. They know a lot of the terminology. They know the basics of construction. An engineering guy comes to work for you. They might not even know the terminology. They might not even know what an RFI is. Okay. And again, this is, I'm making just basic comparisons here. The engineer is going to outwork and outperform the building construction guy. It typically will outlearn because the pressure of getting an engineering degree and all the course load and the analytics required for engineering compared to building construction, they're going to just sponge it right up. They are going to absolutely absorb it. And that engineer will surpass that building construction guy that come in at the same time. Building construction guy is going to have that immediate bump, that immediate jump. It's like a sugar high. But that engineer is going to outlast you. And long-term, they're going to understand how to approach. and let... Now, can the engineer have a... The key is building construction guys typically have a better social. <laughs> like they can talk. Sometimes you go into engineering and you're a little bit of, you know, the old... Milton, where's my stapler kind of thing from you know, the <laughs> office, right? So that doesn't necessarily work in construction. So you got to have somebody who has a personality. Um, but that's really the key is, is trying to get that experience and try to, to pull that on. And then once you start, once you get in, if you want to go into construction, you got to approach it. it. It's like boot camp. You know, the problem with construction, unlike design or becoming an owner's rep, or going to work for the government or public is there's crazy expectations and the work hours and the workload are nuts. And you're always learning something. So you go from an office terminology might change, but you go from an office engineer to a project engineer, to an assistant project manager, to a project manager. That's just about 10 years. And some of these people, and now because of society, people just get these titles right away. So I'll interview people and they're like, I'm a PM. Well, you are. You just graduated like three years ago. How are you a PM? Oh, I was a PM. I fit up a T-Mobile store and oh, I did a Starbucks. That's not a PM in my book. The PM in my book is you got everything. I can drop you on a $10 million job and you understand and you've got everything except for the weird changes or an issue that comes up that you might need a mentor, a senior PM, a project exec, but you understand everything. Buyout scopes, change management, contracts, lien law, owner contracts, back-end accounting, cash flow, cash projections, all those sorts of things. Um, it's a huge gamut and a huge difference in terms of those processes go. So it takes time. So it's a thankless job is my point is when you decide to go into construction and it's when I'm interviewing, 
I'm not the flowery road. I'm almost trying to discourage people from coming in because once then you go and say, look, we're 50, 60 hours a week. You don't get paid as much as you go into design to start or any of these things. But the progression goes. You're As a designer, you start out higher, you go, but then you eventually you plateau until you create, even if you're on your design firm or whatever. Whereas construction, you start out slow and it grows and grows and grows and grows and grows like rapidly and then just can keep going too, based on what you're bringing in. Um, but it's a different curve and you're always making mistakes as an office engineer, you're making mistakes. And then as soon as you get that down, you become a project engineer and then you're learning all new things and it's taking you longer and you have to spend more time. So it's this constant process. Whereas if you're an engineer or designer, right, you're sitting in a cubicle and you're doing CAD and you might get more responsibilities, but it's just not the same. So you really got to have the right mindset to be able to handle construction because this job will, this profession can wreck you. You know, it's, you got to put the time and the effort in. And a lot of people sometimes don't want to do that. Yeah. Gary, this has been a, a fascinating conversation. And I just have one last quick question that might be similar to the last one. Um, but Josh and I um, interface with a lot of young students that are in design and they want to design theme parks and that type of thing. And you've talked a lot about the construction side and even the relationship between the construction folks and the designers. What advice might you have for those folks that are that are they're young, they're new to the industry, they're they're really excited about des- the design part of it and maybe interfacing with the construction side or or what they would need to know that maybe isn't part of their kind of trajectory, but you think from your experience, man, you really need to know these things too. Yeah. So it's tough. If you just want to go into design, I would say the first advice then is if you're going to go into design, try to work part-time or internship for some sort of theme park or some sort of what whatever particular space you're trying to go in. Cause you got to know the real operations and ins and outs. That's going to help your design the means and methods, right, of how things work versus just how they look. That's my first. If you can get lucky enough to intern, um, and it's probably an intern and you're going to be at a lower rate because no one's going to want to pay you if you're going to turn around and leave, um, try to work for a general contractor that's doing stuff at a theme park. That That's huge, you know, and the sacrifice you'll make at doing that is going to pay off tenfold to you long run you go work for a designer going as you're going to apply for a designer and tell them that you interned in the summers for a general contractor even if you were just it's photo it's all digital now right but even if you're just paper pushing even digital paper pushing doesn't matter you just the experience and hearing and understanding the terminology and reading the stuff that you're processing is going to gain you that whole much experience. having those conversations with people um so even if you're doing the most menial task possible, get in that door. Um, because if you really want to design and get involved in designing rides and theme parks and everything else and want to grow, you're going to have to have that. You're going to have to know how stuff put, gets put together. Mm-hmm. I always joke with designers. Anyone can design anything. Can you build it? <laughs> and can it be built for a reasonable price? So that that's my key. That That's my advice. It's great advice. Thanks so much for sharing. Uh, Jerry, this has been just such a a fascinating conversation. Uh, As we start to wind this down, if people want to learn more about Peak CM or if they want to get a hold of you directly, where would you send them? Um, The best way to go is to our website, probably start. So that's peakcm.com, which is P-E-A-K, C is in Charlie, M is in Mary. The kind of the joke is that that's all one word, doesn't stand for anything just kind of is a mix of what we've done and what we've done. So we've done work at ski resorts. One of our first clients had peak in their name, um, kind of peak of your profession. There's peaks of buildings, you know, so there's a lot of different aspects to it. And then CM doesn't stand for construction manager. It can, it can stand for construction management. Um, it just, it's that branding guy. Actually, I give him the credit from the guy from that ski resort is we just kind of messed with it where it doesn't have to stand really for anything. It's how those things kind of go together. Um, But our website's probably the best and that has all our contact information and phone numbers and email addresses. And our main office is in Orlando. 
can feel free to reach out to us, um, phone or email also. Awesome. Well, Jerry, thank you again for your time. We'll have to send Mike a quick note and thank you for the intro thank him for the introduction. Um, but again, this has been just a great conversation. I know I've learned a lot. Um, and so for everybody out there who's watching and listening, just remember, we are all Attraction Pros. Thanks for listening to the Attraction Pros podcast. Make sure to subscribe so you can tune in when new episodes release. And even better, please leave us a review on iTunes. For more information, visit attractionpros.com.